Hello, everyone, and welcome to Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a podcast feature of Singularity Weblog, where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. As you may already know, my name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and as always, I am the man with the questions. Today, the guest on the show is Jose Cordeiro. Jose is on the faculty of Singularity University and where he often spoke about his favorite topic, which is the energularity. And this is the reason why I invited him to speak to us here today. So, hello, Jose, and welcome to Singularity One-on-One. Hello, Nicola. It is a pleasure to be with you to talk about energy and about the energularity. That is fantastic, Jose. So before we dump, uh, before we, we, we drive into the topic, um, I would like to start my interviews usually by asking uh, a little more details about uh, the personal background of the person that I'm interviewing. Uh, because I want to find out not only what you do, but who you are, because I believe those two things are very much connected. So if you were to describe yourself in your own words, how would you describe yourself? Well, uh, today I work as a futurist. So basically, I look at future trends and see what is happening. And uh, that is what I'm doing right now. But um, I have gone through many changes in my life. And most of my uh, working life, actually, I worked as an energy expert, uh, trying to find new energy sources. That is fascinating. And um, one of the most interesting, perhaps, uh, stories that our viewers uh, are not aware just yet of is that you almost became the Minister of Energy of Venezuela. So would you mind sharing a little bit about that story, how it unfolded and how it ended up that you didn't become the Minister of Energy? Uh, During 1997 and 1998, I was the energy advisor to one of the presidential candidates of Venezuela. Her name, Irene Saez Conde, a beautiful woman, in fact, so beautiful that she was Miss Universe. She had been Miss Universe uh, 1980, representing Venezuela. And after becoming Miss Universe, she went into politics and she was the mayor of Caracas. And then when she was the mayor of Chacao, Caracas, she asked me if I wanted to work with her and be her energy advisor and energy minister of Venezuela if she won. Unfortunately, in 1998, instead of the Miss Universe and the beautiful mayor of Chacao, Caracas, winning the election, it was Chavez, Hugo Chavez, who won. So I say it is a tragedy. It was not the beauty that won, but the beast. <laughs> well, but, but, but then the question is, uh, were those fair elections in your opinion? Because if they were, then I guess that the people spoke. At that time, yes, that was probably the last fair election in Venezuela in 1998. Since that time, the political situation in Venezuela changed a lot, and we cannot say anymore that there are free elections in Venezuela today. Yeah, that kind of reminds me to an old saying which goes about to claim that uh, most revolutionaries end up being tyrants. And as we know from history, that's what happened um, during the French Revolution, and there's numerous other examples, and perhaps it is not so hard to claim that uh, this is exactly what happened and is still going on in Venezuela, unfortunately. Um, and, and I was even reading recently that, that Caracas is the most dangerous city with something like, or Venezuela, 50 murders per day, some shocking statistics like that. Uh, yeah, the numbers are really horrible. Uh, actually, in Caracas, it is 50 murders per week, not per day, per week. Per and week. in the rest of the country, about another 50. So it is close to 100 people being killed per week. That gives, if you multiply it 100 times, um, uh, you know, 50 52. to a week, that makes over um, 5,000 people uh, who, who are killed um, every year in Venezuela. This is like a civil war that is happening in Venezuela. Yeah, that's that's shocking. But uh, on the other hand, it couldn't be then the highest because if those numbers are 5,200, 5, I think in in uh, Mexico for the last couple of years, it was definitely over 10,000. And I've heard numbers with such as 20,000 and, and so on. Uh, but anyway, let's... Yeah, yeah, the difference... No, no, no. The difference is the population. Mexico has 110 million people. Venezuela has less than 
30 million people. So if you uh, do it per capita, absolutely. per capita terms, the numbers are the highest, sadly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's turn the, tap, the tape a little bit further backward and, and, and start with this question. How did you become to be interested in energy and how did you get involved in the energy industry? I know that you're a, an engineer by education. I know that you're a former um, graduate of, of, you are a graduate of MIT. So how did you start with MIT and end it going up in the oil and gas business? Well, as a child, I always loved uh, science fiction and space travel and all the things happening uh, uh, or possible uh, in the world. I used to read uh, Jules Verne. So Jules Verne was really a motivator for me. Uh, when I finished high school, I won a scholarship to go to MIT. And when I arrived to MIT, I read one of the most famous books uh, ever written, which I have here, which is The Limits to Growth. The Limits to Growth actually, um, that came out in 1972, and I read in 1980 when I arrived at MIT, uh, was a best-selling book talking about the coming collapse of civilization because of energy problems, shortages, pollution, uh, overpopulation, and so on and so forth. So from that time at MIT, I became more and more interested in, in the future of humanity and the future of energy particularly. So I studied mechanical engineering, and I began working as a energy engineer for a French multinational called Slamberger, and I traveled with them uh, to five continents looking for oil and gas. So basically, I began working in the fossil fuels industry. Uh, now we have moved, and, and I am working more onto renewable energy, but I did begin looking for a, a natural gas and oil around the world. And then how did you and why did you make the transition from the oil and gas industry into um, being even more interested and more focused on advanced technologies and especially um, involved in uh, as a faculty of Singularity University? Well, for that, I will have to show you another book, uh, <laughs> which is... Uh, here, <laughs> the singularity is near, okay? Uh, oh, oh, I have it wrong, okay. Yeah, yeah, the singularity is near. Um, I met actually Ray Kurzweil in 2001 um, when he was presenting his previous book, uh, which was called uh, The Age of Spiritual Machines. So I met him in a conference by the World Future Society, and I really became interested in uh, the things that he was talking about, and also the changes that were happening in energy, that there was an energy transition coming up, uh, which I was aware of because he was also interested uh, in uh, solar energy. So basically, when you realize how much potential we have in terms of solar energy, we have over 10,000 times more solar energy that the human civilization uses today. So we have incredible amounts of solar energy while fossil fuels are decreasing because we don't have unlimited fossil fuels, but we do have unlimited solar energy. So basically, this is how I got more involved into renewable energies. And then, talking about the singularity and Ray Kurzweil, when I read in 2008 that a new university was being created with a Ray Kurzweil, who is actually from MIT, with a co-founder, uh, Peter Diamandis, who is also from MIT, let me tell you. So both of them are MIT alumni. I contacted... Um, all my friends, all my people, because I wanted to be involved with that university from the beginning. And so I started working in 2009 for the summer program uh, at Singularity University. Uh, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. So um, let me just dive a little bit deeper onto the Singularity University topic, and then we'll go back to energy. Uh, so what is the purpose of Singularity University anyway? Well, I think it's the greatest idea of the world to prepare humanity for the transition that we're going to see in the next 20, 30, 40 years with all these converging technologies that I normally refer to NBIC, NBIC, Nano, Bio, Info, and Cogno. So these technologies, these new sciences are radically changing humanity. 
and even more, they are changing human beings. We are being changed by these technologies at an exponential rate of change. So this is actually a change that is accelerating and going faster and faster and faster. And we will change from the old world using fossil fuels, for example, talking about energy, to a new world of almost unlimited possibilities and unlimited energy. So, um, where does Singularity University fit within your own personal goals um, and motivation? Well, I think uh, Singularity University is a very uh, unique concept of preparing leaders for this new world of the technological singularity. Because I have also been working as an academic for some part of my life. I feel very at home teaching in this place where we are trying to find leaders for this transition towards a better and more energetic humanity. And as one of the former students of Singularity University and current alumni, I can personally vouch that you are, in fact, the highest energy uh, faculty member of Singularity University by far. You create uh, an energularity of, of your own during uh, your time that you spend on the stage. So perhaps now is the time to ask you, what does the energularity mean? Did you coin the term and what does it stand for? Um, yes, as far as I know, I invented the term, which is uh, based on the idea of the singularity, uh, but for energy. Uh, there is um, a previous name that was also invented by Aubrey de Grey. Aubrey de Grey, who is also an invited faculty at Singularity University, he created the idea of the methuselarity. The methuselarity being the time when we will reach escape velocity of living long enough to live forever. So this idea of the methuselarity or the singularity inspired me to create a concept for energy. And what best concept that to reach a point where uh, humanity will have almost unlimited amounts of energy. And for that, I actually use the energy scale of the universe which was created by a Russian scientist called Nikolai Kardashev. Nikolai Kardashev, who is still alive in, the, in Russia, he uh, wrote in the 1960s about the energy uh, scale of the universe, beginning with a planet uh, that uses all the energy available to it that has uh, civilization type one. Uh, then a civilization type two is one civilization that uses all the energy available to the solar system. So not just to the planet, but to the whole solar system where the planet is located. And then civilization type three to the galaxy. And then uh, eventually we can talk about civilization type four, a civilization that uses all the power, all the energy available to the uh, super cluster of gal uh, galaxies. And finally, civilization type five, when we reach all the power available in the known universe. Okay, so that's a lot of energy. And uh, we humans right now are actually at a very, very tiny level of uh, civilization type one. We are uh, almost nothing in terms of the amount of energy that we have available to our planet. So the idea then is to reach uh, this energularity or reaching civilization type one, according to Nikolai Kardashev, energy scale for the universe. 